Hello, developers and architects. I'm sure many of you are building applications where things need to happen in the background, where you've got some kind of process that needs to run without blocking your critical user flow. Imagine, for example, whenever a user registers for your application, you want to send them an email welcoming them to your amazing SaaS product or service. That's not something you really want to happen as part of your critical flow. You want your response times to be snappy, remember. So how can you shift that into a background process. And that is where the magic of queuing comes to your rescue. Your main application can simply push a message onto a queue, and then you can have some kind of background process reading off the queue, doing the work, sending the emails to delight your users. How do you do that on Cloudflow? And that's what I wanna show you in this video. I want to demonstrate to you the Cloudflow queue service, a way you can add queuing to your applications running on Cloudflow, and how you can do that with Rust to send emails whenever users register for your application. Interested? Well, join me and find out how to do that. So let's talk about queuing. How can you implement queuing when you're using Cloudflare? And like many of these videos, the Terraform support for Cloudflare is pretty good when you're doing anything that isn't a worker. Inside the infra folder, inside the main.tf file, you're creating a Cloudflare queue. This is a queue for user notifications. Remember the use case you have is you want to send an email to a user whenever they register for your service. So you've created the queue, and as you're probably becoming familiar with now, whenever you run a Terraform apply, you're going to get back an ID for the resource. In this case, you've got the queue ID, and then you can use that to create a binding. Again, if this is your first time coming across Cloudflare workers, all of the integration with other services, other providers, the queues, the databases, the caches, all works using bindings. Now inside the actual source folder, you've got this queue processor application. This is the application that's gonna receive the messages from the queue and send the emails. You've also inside your authentication service also got a binding to the queue. And when you're binding to a queue in Cloudflare, there are two types of bindings you will see. Here, you've got a queues.producers binding it's this authentication service when a user gets created is going to produce a message onto the queue. And you've then got inside the queue processor, you've got a queues.consumers binding because this worker is going to consume messages from the queue. There's also a producer in here as well. I'll come back to that in just a moment. So inside the authentication service, this is what is actually going to push the message onto the queue. Inside the lib.rs, when the actual application starts up, I can pull the user notifications binding, env.queue.the name of my binding, and that gives me this queue struct. I can then pass that queue into the user repository. So when the user repository gets created, it both needs the client to actually connect to the Postgres database and also the queue to be able to send the messages. If you go and have a look at this user repository implementation, particularly when the add user function is called. So whenever an insert happens to the database, if the insert is successful, you're going to call the queue.send and you want to send a message onto the queue. In this case, I'm going to send a user DTO object and I'm going to send the username and the email address of the user that has just registered. If you look at this queue struct, there's a bunch of different functions here. You can send a single message, send a batch of messages, and also send raw messages. So sending the message is reasonably straightforward. You've got the queue binding, you can call the send function, and just send data onto the queue. Nice and simple. What about consuming from queues though? If you go and have a look under the queue processor and at the lib.rs, You'll have seen previously when you're building APIs, you have this event fetch macro. This is what tells Cloudflare that this worker has a fetch endpoint. It can receive HTTP requests. So when you're building with queues, you simply use a different macro. Here, I'm using the event. This function is going to handle an event. And in this case, it's going to be an event from a queue. The only difference between a queue macro and a fetch macro is the parameters that the actual function takes. So you've still got your env and your context as you would with a fetch, but then instead of it being a HTTP request struct, you've got this batch of messages and you can pass in a type to the message batch and workers will automatically deserialize the incoming payload into the struct that you specify. 
So this is going to be a batch of messages that are a user DTO type. Much like when building with any kind of worker, I'm going to read a couple of secrets that are bound to this worker, namely the API key for SendGrid so that I can actually send an email and the from address that I want the email to come from. Then I can iterate over each message in the batch of messages and you can go off and actually just send the email. So the logic in here is reasonably straightforward. It's going to iterate all of the messages that have come in this batch, send the message, and then importantly, you need to call this message.act function. That's going to acknowledge the message and delete it from the queue. If you don't act the message like this, the message is going to go back onto the queue and be reprocessed. So this is, you can use this to handle errors. If there was a failure of some kind and you want to retry, you can simply just not call the act function and the message is going to go back onto the queue. The other thing you do have in here, you can actually bind the same worker to multiple different queues. If you were to bind multiple queues to the same worker, you could actually get the name of the queue from this queue function. This will give you a string representation of the actual queue that these messages came from. And then you could, you could match on the queue and do different things based on the name of the queue that comes in. The name of the queue you get in this string will be the name of the queue here because I've only got one queue bound to this worker. I don't actually need the match, but if you were to handle multiple queues with the same worker, you could just do a simple match statement to switch which queue you're actually working with. So one of the interesting things with how queues work is with the local developer experience. So as of the time I'm recording this video, local development will only work if you're consuming and producing to a queue inside the same running local instance of the worker. So when you look at the wrangler.toml for this queue processor, you see there is both a consumer and a producer configured. And also inside the application code, I'm also handling a slash API slash test endpoint. This will allow me to run this worker locally and send messages onto the queue that will then be picked up and processed. When this gets deployed actually into Cloudflare, because I've got this workers dev equals false, that fetch endpoint won't be exposed publicly, which means that any old random person can't send messages onto the queue. What this does mean though, is that if I navigate into that queue processor folder and run npx wrangler dev, I can run a local instance of my worker that's going to set up and run on port 8787. So I can actually take that local running instance, localhost 8787. I can send a get request to that from my local browser, passing in an email address, which is test.test.com and a username of James. If I hit that, that's going to send a message onto the queue. And you see, I've got some log messages here. Username is James, email is test.test.com. And then this request is actually going to fail because test at test.com is not an email address I have set up as verified inside my SendGrid account. So that unauthorized is expected, at least while we're testing things out locally. What this does show you though, is that when you actually hit that API test endpoint, that's going to run this handle test. It's going to send a message onto the queue. Then the actual queue handler is sending that username is email is log message, which is what you're seeing in the logs here. So you have a way to do local development. You just need to make sure you add that endpoint to be able to send messages onto the queue and then make sure you block that endpoint when it's deployed using this workers dev equals false. So that's the local development experience. What about the deployed instance of the application? So here I'm in the Cloudflare UI and I've set up a log stream. So I'm connected to the logs for my queue processor. And what I'm just going to do in my other window is I'm actually going to register for a new user account. So I'm going to do this over here simply because I'm using my personal email address and well, I don't want to expose that publicly to all of YouTube. So I'm going to create a new user and I'm going to create that on my other screen. You'll have to believe that I've just created that. The registration has been successful. In a second or two, what you will see is that a message will be processed by the queue. There's that message from the process request. And if I open up a log message and scroll down ever so slightly so I don't expose my email address, you see that I've got the message and the username is James, which is the user I use to create the actual user. So that allows me to handle messages from the queue. Really, really easy to set up and get started. And there's a couple of other interesting things inside the Cloudflare UI though. If you go and have a look at the actual created queue, you get a whole bunch of really cool metrics about how exactly things are going, successes, failures, how many messages have been sent to the dead letter queue. 
you can see who's allowed to produce and who's allowed to consume from this queue. You can also use this messages section to look at the messages that are currently in the queue and also to send a message to the queue. So if we actually try this now, let's set the username to be hello YouTube and the email address to be test at test.com send that message onto the queue that has been posted to the queue we get a success message and if you go and have a look at the logs for your queue processor in a second or two you will see the log message appear you go and have a look and the username is hello youtube and the email is test at test.com of course the request failed again at this point because test at test.com is still not allowed inside my sengrid account so you get all these really cool things that you can do inside the console, you get metrics, and the way you set up the bindings is incredibly simple. And that is really all there is to queuing inside Cloudflare. At the producer side, you create a binding. At the consumer side, you create a binding. You set up the function to receive the message from the queue, iterate over the messages, make sure you acknowledge them if they are successful, and well, you're done. You're queuing, you're building asynchronous background processes inside Cloudflare Workers. Simple as that. See you all in the next video.